Not just cheaper imports, but better ones. Not just imitated technologies, but innovative ones. People and ideas moving in both directions. Now we tend to think of immigration of movement to places like Britain, Europe and America. But increasingly, migrants are moving in all directions. East as well as west, south as well as north. There are more Brits abroad than foreigners in Britain. And they're starting to move to China. There are already more than 600,000 foreigners in China. That's 13 times more than 13 years ago. And they include Westerners working there illegally. <laughs> Westerners, illegal immigrants, whatever next. <laughs> and migration is also less permanent than it was. Because in the age of Ryanair and the internet, migrants often move again, back home or somewhere else. A quarter of those who arrived in Britain in 1998 Sorry, only a quarter of those who arrived in Britain in 1998 are still here. And these newly mobile people are a bit like bees. They're flying from flower to flower and they're cross-pollinating them. So perhaps we should jettison the word immigration and start talking instead about a kaleidoscope of mobility. And that promises a whole new world of opportunities for people, a wider and more flexible pool of talent for companies, and a proliferation of new ideas and businesses, both within economies and across global migrant networks. Now globally, of course, it's still the privilege of the few. But among the 27 countries of the EU, most and soon all of the 500 million people can move freely. Now who would have guessed 20 years ago that East Europeans would be free to live and work anywhere they want in Western Europe? Who would have dared think that open borders from Estonia to Estepona would soon be perceived as normal? And this remarkable experiment with open borders has shredded many of the myths about it. No, not everyone has come, and many of those who did have already left again. All 75 million East Europeans could have moved to Britain, only one million have, and over half of them have gone again. Many move back and forth regularly, like international commuters. Society hasn't collapsed. Recent arrivals have more than paid their way. In fact, newcomers of all cultural backgrounds are twice as lucky, twice as likely to start a new business as people born in Britain. And would London be half as vibrant as rich, and half as, half as rich without a constant un influx of people, not just from around the country, but also from around the world? And then think, well, Romania is poorer than Mexico. And if freedom of movement works so well within the EU, why wouldn't it well work well elsewhere too? <coughs> now nobody could have guessed when he arrived as a child refugee from the Soviet Union that Sergey Brin was going to go on and co-found Google. If he'd been denied entry, America would never have realised the opportunity it had missed. Now think about it, how many potential Sergey Brins does Europe turn away? And at what cost? Now, prospects for freeing up, global, freeing up global migration may seem bleak for now, but things could change. As baby boomers start to retire, they're going to stop worrying about who's going to take my job and start thinking, who's going to look after me when I need care? Young people who've grown up in a culturally diverse background tend to be more open to newcomers. And pragmatism can also persuade, because surely it's better if people cross borders safely and legally rather than risk their lives and then live outside the law. Above all, we need to persuade people that preventing others from moving freely is an unacceptable violation of their human rights. Now, unfortunately, the crisis is causing an upsurge of protectionism against products as well as people. And then, of course, there's a danger of an even bigger backlash that could wreck the recovery, it could pit emerging powers against existing ones and jeopardise efforts to combat climate change. And that damage could be huge and lasting because the last time we closed our borders in the 1920s and the 1930s, it took decades and a world war to open them up again. We must not make that mistake again. Now the crisis has depressed not just our economy, but our mood. Many Europeans worry that their best days are behind us. People want to hide away from the world and hunker down. And the cheerfulness of the Chinese, the Indians and the Brazilians only darkens our gloom. And it's true, yes, the present is painful and the future is full of dangers. Another cycle of bubble, bust and bailout. 
a Greek-style debt crisis, a retreat into protectionism and prejudice, a climate catastrophe. But if we fix global finance, reform the tax system, reshape the UK and world economy on, along healthier lines, open up economies and societies and embrace a low-carbon future, then a safer, fairer, richer and cleaner world is possible. The world is still rich with, op with opportunities for progress if we reach out and grab them. The boundless op optimism of people in emerging economies should inspire us, not frighten us. Until recently, we were tapping the brain power of only a tiny minority of humanity. Wang Chuan Fu, the guy who founded BYD, grew up on a farm in extreme poverty in a country where enterprise was forbidden. And now, his company's electric cars are at the cutting edge of technology. The Industrial Revolution raised the living standards of a tiny fraction of, my, of humanity above the rest. And now it is lifting up most people, though sadly not yet all. But just think how much faster, how much further humanity could progress if Africa emulated China's success, if women were liberated in the Arab world, if people were set free to live and work wherever they want, if Silicon Valley's entrepreneurial magic cast its spell on Europe, and if every person, every young person in Britain got a fair start in life. Now Thomas Friedman wrote a best-selling book called The World is Flat. But in reality, the world is anything but flat. Because the biggest determinant of your life chances is not how talented you are, it's not how hard you work, it's where you were born and who your parents were. And an open world made up of open societies can help change that. Because it's not just a, a matter of breaking down border barriers, it's about breaking down barriers within society and changing people's attitudes. It's about combating discrimination, xenophobia and exclusion. It's about embracing difference and change. So the new dividing line in politics is between those who believe in dynamic, open and progressive societies and those who want to shut the doors and turn the clock back. Open societies can create new freedoms, new opportunities, new ideas, greater variety and diversity, better lives in the broadest sense. In other words, progress. In, in Amartya Sen's words, progress is about expanding the power to do things, the freedom and the capacity to realize your dreams. And that's why we also need progressive governments that enforce fair laws, promote social mobility, equip people for change, catch us when we fall, and break down the monopolistic bastions of land ownership and finance. Above all, though, we need optimism. The optimism to try to improve things, invest in the future and embrace change. The optimism that views challenges, even crises, as opening up new possibilities. Crises don't come much bigger than this. The pain is undeniable. The injustice, flagrant. The world is a desperately unfair place, but it is also full of promise. We would be mad to close ourselves off to its possibilities. Let's give our future a chance. Thank you.